It is my great pleasure to introduce Dave Zirin. Dave Zirin writes about the politics of sports for Nation Magazine. He is their first sports writer in 150 years of existence. Zirin is also the host of Sirius XM Radio's popular weekly show, Edge of Sports Radio. He also co-hosts the radio program, The Collision, Sports and Politics with Eaton Thomas and Dave Zirin. Author of eight books on the politics of sports, he has been called the best sports writer in the United States. By Ro Robert Leipzig, Zyron won the 2015 National Headliner Award for online magazine writing and sports and society, and Northeastern University School of Journalism's Excellence in Sports Journalism Award. He was nominated for an NAACP Image Award for his book, The John Carlos Story, The Sports Moment That Changed the World, and the Penn American Award for Literary Sports Writing. He is, in addition, a columnist for Slam Magazine and The Progressive. I'm a huge fan. I'd like you to help me welcome Dave Zyron. Oh, man, it's embarrassing. <laughs> It, it uh, never ceases to be embarrassing to have someone inter introduce you at a public event. Um, but I do appreciate it. Thank you so much. Oh, coffee. coffee. Yeah, that's always welcome in any academic setting. Um, oh, absolutely. Thank you. Fix my cord. Zipper up. Okay. Um, so, so quick question before we start. I just like getting a, a read of a crowd anytime I talk about sports on a campus, anything like that. And believe me, um, we're going to talk about a lot. Is just first and foremost, uh, how many people here like absolutely love sports? Like you consider yourself like not, not obsessed, but maybe, you know, you have family members who are a little worried about you. Okay, good. Um, how many people consider yourself a sports fan? Like you follow what's happening, but it's hardly the first thing you turn to in the morning, but you're a fan. Okay, that's good. Uh, how many people would rather shave your head with a cheese grater than hear somebody talk about sports? Excellent. Uh, what, what's your name, ma'am, if I could ask you? Yes. Jenna, okay. So the goal for this talk is to do something that speaks to the diehard sports fans, the casual sports fans, and Jenna. Um, I'll be honest with you guys, like I grew up an absolutely absolutely nuts sports fan. New York City, uh, 1980s, long time ago. You can't imagine what that was like back then. Wars in the Middle East, I, 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 poverty, urban unrest. Um, and in the 1980s, I was a big fan of everything. Baseball, basketball, football. The only thing I didn't play or watch was golf, which I still don't consider to be a sport. Um, this is my own personal litmus test. We can dialogue about this, but anything that you can smoke cigarettes or gain weight while doing, not a sport. Um, and I never gave much thought to the politics of sports, and yet that's something that became more and more clear to me, that there is this hidden history of sports and politics. And I wrote a book called A People's History of Sports in the United States about all the different ways that sports and politics have always been intertwined in this country. In fact, as long as there have been organized sports in this country, there have been politics in sports. Like I ask folks sometimes like do you know the you know how the president is always like posing with sports teams when they win championships people have seen that right? Like who is the first president to ever invite a pro sports team to the White House? And I always ask folks like throw out a name. Who do you think it might be? We got some history folks here. Who do you think it might be? Nixon. Nixon's a great guess and not an uncommon guess. It's also wrong. Uh, but it's a great guess. Nixon was, as he was described by uh, one rebel football player who met him once, a disturbing football freak. Uh, yes. Reagan. Reagan. Also a very good guess. He was once a sports announcer, actually, back in the day. But not Reagan. Taft. Taft is a great guess, probably rooted in the fact that you know he was the first person. That's why we stand up in, uh, was it the seventh inning stretch? But it was really because William Howard Taft, he was, you know, he was uh, a large man. He was full figured and he needed to stand for his, for circulation purposes. But Taft is a great guess as well. Now the answer though is Johnson, but not Lyndon Johnson, Andrew Johnson. 1867 Cincinnati Red Stockings. Taft was pretty close, but still about 40 years off uh, what we're talking about here. And that's 
the first professional sports team in U.S. history, the Cincinnati Red Stockings. They went to the White House in 1867 to pose with Andrew Johnson. So as long as there has been sports, there have been people in power, and I want to emphasize that, people in power who have used sports for political ends. And that's something that, of course, runs to today, whether you agree with their politics or not, whether it's uh, George W. Bush uh, speaking, being interviewed right before the Super Bowl, or whether it's Barack Obama being interviewed right before the Super Bowl. Like the idea of using sports to speak out um, to, as a political platform is as old as sports itself. But also, as long as there have been sports, there have been people who use sports as a platform for resistance. And if you think about it, it makes perfect sense because. First of all, sports have existed in human society as long as there have been humans. Basically, as long as human beings, and this is what anthrop this is an anthropologist, anthropologists say, is that as soon as people could actually clothe themselves and feed themselves, you know, take care of those very basic things and, and shelter, they played games. So sports is as old as human society. And in the United States, sports is as old as long as there have been people on this land, starting back, of course, with Native American culture. And everybody played sports, boys and girls together, variety of games. It's something that transcended race, it transcended class, it transcended gender. So if we could go on a time machine and go to a southern slave plantation, you would see sports being played in the big house and the slave house. You would see boys and girls playing together on both sides of that divide. They may not have played together, but everybody played. And fast forward though to the times that we're talking about here, Andrew Johnson organized professional sports, that changes. Like the idea of professionalizing sports. These were very new concepts in the late 19th, early 20th century. The idea that we would pay to watch sports. The idea that sports would be separated into those who watch and those who play. That was a very new idea. And the idea of people playing sports for the first time was tied to the idea of if you play sports, then you're going to be not just a great person, but the kind of person who's going to lead this country in the 20th century to a bright new day. The American century, the 20th century, would be defined by people who played sports. Yet, who was allowed to play sports? Because when you say people, you've got to put that in big quotes. Because as organized sports started, it changed from, remember the description of slave house, big house, black, white, men, women, it changed to the people who were allowed to play sports. You're talking very specifically about white men. And not just white men, but white wealthy men. I mean, the first sports ran through the new um, urban middle classes and upper classes. It wasn't something that poor people either had the time or inclination to do. And not just white middle upper class men, but white middle upper class men who had a style about themselves that was, for lack of a better term, manly. And sports was how a manly man showed himself would be the manliest man of all men. And the great person who, um, I say great in terms of just fame, not in terms of his greatness, but the great person who pushed this idea and played a really important role in pushing this idea was a president of the United States who really liked to walk slowly and liked to talk about his big stick. Who was that? Teddy Roosevelt. Teddy Roosevelt. Loved talking about his big stick. And Teddy Roosevelt, um, he was actually somebody who's responsible for, um, for pushing, for projecting the, the, this word that is going to be familiar to you guys, which is the word sissy. And sissy was a word to describe not people who maybe necessarily had gay sex or anything like that, but sissy was used to describe the kind of man who was effeminate, who did not play manly sports. And what does it mean to be effeminate? To be a woman, that means you are weak and do not play sports. So all of these ideas existed at the start of sports, and I, I say all that to say, that because of that, sports became a very commonsensical place for people to project resistance. Because if sports is a place where you show that you're fit to lead the new American century, and you happen to be black, you happen to be a woman, you happen to be gay, you happen to be a worker, and you say, wait a minute, I can compete on a level playing field with Teddy Roosevelt, I'm going to show that I can do that, that in and of itself becomes a political act. Are you guys following me here? 
So it's like when you have um, the ideas of the time saying things like no black person could ever be heavyweight boxing champion of the world because black people lack the discipline to be good athletes. That was what people said at the time. And they would actually, they, it wasn't just people saying it like on a microphone. I, I, well, of course, microphones didn't exist, but they weren't just saying it like at a college campus. But like, I'm talking like doctors, Journal of American Medicine, psychiatric societies. They would be like, the, the Negro mind is not able to achieve in sports. But then you have Jack Johnson first heavyweight first black heavyweight champion that in and of itself becomes a political act that Jack Johnson wins this title and that's why after Jack Johnson won the title against Jim Jeffries uh, in this country you had the largest widespread urban riots that this country had ever seen or ever would see until the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King in 1968 that was after a boxing match and it happened because you had white lynch mobs attempting to enter black neighborhoods in cities. And remember, even the idea of a city was a new thing at this time, was trying to enter cities as a way to um, show their anger that Jack Johnson had beaten Jim Jeffries, who was called the Great White Hope. And Jack Johnson was, of course, somebody who told everybody to kiss his behind when they said, they, and you know, and this is all gonna sound very familiar, history, you know, Mark Twain once said history doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. Um, Jack Johnson uh, was asked, was begged, was ordered by Booker T. Washington, who was considered the most prominent black leader of his day, to condemn the rioters. And not just, not the white rioters, but the black rioters. He's like, condemn them. And Jack Johnson refused to do it. Instead, he, he, what he said instead was, why should I ask anyone to apologize for celebrating for me showing that I was Jim Jeffries' master? Now you have to think about this. You know, that today might sound like very mild trash talk. I'm that person's master. But you're talking like 50 years after the end of slavery, first black heavyweight champion, he's saying I'm this person's master. And Jack Johnson is saying it in a climate where lynchings are taking place two out of every three days in this country. So sports, always a place where people not only used it to project political ideas from positions of power, but where people of color, women, LGBT people, working class people attempted to use it as a place to say, hey, wait a minute, I'm human too. I'm part of this country too. I'm part of this American family too. And because sports is on this hyper elevated platform, it would always become this, like people say, why are athletes role models? Well, it's because they've been able to project this idea of equality, of decency, and of this idea that if you give us a level playing field, we will achieve. And, and that very, very thin um, air tunnel to be able to show the world that greatness is possible if given the opportunity was able to express itself through sports time and again. If greatness is denied and people are able to then show their greatness, it can have an impact that inspires people uh, for generations to come. And I could do a whole talk about uh, the, the, the historical importance of everybody from, from Jackie Robinson, Muhammad Ali, Billie Jean King. I mean, the stories are amazing. I've written about them. We could talk about them. People can ask about them. But instead of doing that, what I, what I, I'm changing my remarks because what I, what I want to talk about instead is now that I've laid out this idea that people use sports for the idea of projecting political ideas to folks who might otherwise not hear them, I wanna bring that full circle to today, to the Black Lives Matter movement, to what has happened in Baltimore, uh, to the death of Freddie Gray, and to the movements that have been happening around the country. Because one of the things, I don't, out of curiosity, how many folks were at the demonstration last Saturday in Baltimore City? Okay, I, I was there as well. Um, I thought you looked familiar. No, I'm just kidding, it was big. Um, but, it was, but one of the things about that demonstration, one of the tactics of it that it did, and this is something that has happened in cities around the country, is that it wasn't just a march, but it marched towards Camden Yards in Baltimore. And that's not a coincidence. That was not a happenstance. Because for two reasons. One, on the big picture level, People from New York City to DC to Portland, Oregon to Boston uh, when, to St. Louis, when they have done these marches, they have marched towards the sports stadiums for two reasons. One, because it is a place to actually get uh, interaction with thousands of other people. Two, there tends to be some media out there. And three, 
to project an idea that was first put forth in St. Louis, which is that black lives have to matter on and off the field. That there's a big hypocrisy in a country that's willing to cheer for black people when they're in a uniform and not care if somebody who looks exactly like that person uh, then finds themselves dead on the street. I mean, seriously, like I know people who when they first saw a picture of Freddie Gray in the paper, their first response was, who does he play for as a young, well-built African-American man, not knowing the story that he was related to, thinking, assuming that he was an athlete and saying, no, not an athlete, someone whose neck was broken by the Baltimore Police Department. Uh, so this idea of marching on stadiums, I mean, it's something that goes back actually to, um, to Ferguson and Michael Brown. Um, when people organized themselves outside where the St. Louis Cardinals were playing and people peppered them with insults, people threw things at them. If you could see this video on YouTube for just going out there and saying Black Lives Matter, Michael Brown Matter, and pointing out that Mike Brown was a big fan of the St. Louis Cardinals and it's like, shouldn't you guys be with us, be upset? I mean, Mike Brown was, was buried with a St. Louis Cardinals baseball cap. And it's like, shouldn't we be talking about this? And people yelled at them and, and all this stuff and said all these sort of horrible uh, racial epithets at them. But afterwards, and I, I know the folks who were at that rally and I interviewed them and I spoke to them, they were actually energized by the experience because the video of people yelling at them went viral on YouTube. And they were like, oh my God, we got more attention for doing this than we have in weeks of rallies. And then they said, you know what, if we got that much attention outside the stadium, maybe we should try something inside the stadium. And they said, but the Cardinals games are always sold out. So they said, well, what are we gonna do? I said, well, the Rams are playing and that's not gonna be sold out, cool. And actually, Rams tickets are actually very inexpensive because people put them on StubHub because no one goes to Rams games. So actually, I know the guy who did this, he put 20 tickets on his credit card. He told me it cost him about 200 bucks, which is not a lot of money for 20 NFL tickets. And they got 20 people in the upper deck on Monday Night Football and they unfurled a banner and it said, Black Lives Matter on and off the field. And ESPN chose not to show it. And yet other news outlets who were there tweeted the image of them holding this big banner and did show it. And then ESPN had to answer the question about why they didn't show it. And then it became a whole nother news cycle all over again. And that's what really started it all in terms of when you think about people like LeBron James, Derrick Rose, the entire Cal Berkeley women's basketball team wearing shirts, said, I can't breathe, hands up, don't shoot. All of these things started because a movement itself imposed itself on the world of sports. Not because athletes showed the way, but because a movement uh, pushed itself into that space. And that's so important because when sports projects these kinds of ideas, one of the powers that it, that it has is that it is the power, and this is the way I put it, as the power to puncture privilege. Uh, like I always tell this story um, about, I have a cousin who, you know, he spends all day driving. That's his job, is that he drives around. Um, do, he's a salesperson. And he wasn't thinking about Black Lives Matter. He wasn't thinking about Michael Brown. He wasn't thinking about Eric Garner. And then LeBron, all he does is listen to sports radio. And then he, they're debating LeBron James wearing this I Can't Breathe shirt. And then he goes, he's like, what's that? And then he goes home and he watches the video. And then he calls me up and he says, they, they, they killed this man on video and I was reading about it and they arrested the guy who took the video, but they didn't arrest the police. He goes, we gotta do something about this. And I'm like, don't worry, people are doing something about this. You know, you didn't just come up with the idea that we have to do something about this, it's happening. And, but it was, it was so fascinating to me that he had the privilege to not care, his kids don't have to worry about the police. He doesn't live in a neighborhood that is a quote unquote food desert without food, poverty, all the rest of it. And yet, and so he has the luxury to not think about Black Lives Matter. And yet when LeBron wears this shirt, all of a sudden it imposes itself on the space where it did not otherwise exist. And so that was one reason on Saturday why marching on Camden Yards really did matter. The other reason though why marching on Camden Yards really did matter is that Camden Yards is in so many ways symbolic of what's wrong with Baltimore. And what's ironic about that is I can tell you is that for 25 years Camden Yards, I'm saying this especially for folks who are under 25 in the room, for 25 years Camden Yards has been held up as what's right about Baltimore. 
you know, the symbol of urban renewal, a symbol of the, the business of the Inner Harbor, uh, the idea of a city on the rise, a city on the comeback, Camden Yards, all the rest of it. Um, what all of that, and, and, and what's worth saying is that after Camden Yards was built, it was replicated in cities around the country. And the replication was always the same. You build kind of an old timey 19th century baseball stadium uh, in cities that like Baltimore used to have industry, used to have decent paying jobs, used to have unions, and has seen those things go by the wayside. So the idea was that sports would become a substitute for anything resembling an urban policy in this country. Sports would become the new, the, at the hub of a new service economy since we're not a manufacturing economy anymore. So you see these stadiums get built in places. We could all do a tour. We go to places like Detroit, Cleveland, Milwaukee, south side of Chicago. I mean, what all these places have in common is that this was what was the industrial hub of the United States decades ago. And now there are places with publicly funded sports teams and sports franchises in the middle of the city. And yet what this has created, it hasn't created like this new utopia, obviously, of, of you know, decent paying jobs that have replaced the union jobs. What it's done instead, and this is what I, what I argue in an article I wrote today, is I use the term, they become like these symbols of racial and economic apartheid. Because, and I use the word apartheid in the, in the actual definition of the word, which means separation. Because you go to games, and what do you see? I mean, you see a lot of people who are in the stands who don't look like people from West Baltimore. You see a huge alienation between the black community in Baltimore and the team itself. And I would say, a side note on this, Chris Rock just did a monologue about this in, um, for HBO Real Sports that people should look up. And he pointed this out, and I felt this too, is that when I was growing up in the 1980s, I grew up in New York City, and I second everything Chris Rock said because he's from New York City too, is that in the 1980s, baseball was a sport that everybody talked about. So it's like if you were in a black barber shop in New York City in the 1980s and you were talking about the Mets, you'd be like Daryl Strawberry, Dwight Gooden, Mookie Wilson. And, and Chris Rock said, if today you were in a black barber shop in New York City and said, what do you think about the Mets? Someone might say, what's a Met? And so you have over the last 30 years, a huge decline in popularity in the black community of, in baseball, both in terms of participation um, and in terms of um, actual interest. And as Chris Rock says, it's weird that that's timed with the growth of these old time ballparks. You know, it's like this, this looking back, you know, glorify the past ballparks. And that's, he makes the point, he said like, look, not everybody in our society thinks of the old days as the good old days. And so if you do things that project the good old days, it's gonna alienate a lot of folks. And this is especially true in Camden Yards where, um, where a lot of, they draw a lot of their employees um, from black Baltimore. And there have been huge fights in Baltimore about paying a living wage. And I wrote, I've been writing about this for years and it's, it's terribly ironic because the owner um, of the Orioles, Peter Angelos, his son, John Angelos, um, they actually come from poor community, like they're both working class family, the Angelos, and they made their money. Um, it, actually, I think Peter Angelos might've gone to this school, actually. I think he went to, he went to BCCC. And, it's, it's, that's, that's how they came up. And yet, not only would they not pay workers a living wage, um, the workers felt like they had no choice in 2007 but to even go on a hunger strike to be able to get a decent wage from the Baltimore Orioles. Now you think about that for a second. These are several, hundreds of people who are feeling like they have to go on a hunger strike to get a paycheck so they can pay their families. And then they're going back to their communities and they're saying, this is what's happening with the Orioles. So the name Oriole is not synonymous with will we win the pennant. It's synonymous with why isn't Peter Angelos paying us a decent wage to put food on our table. And that is what Camden Yards had become. And what it's also become is a place, and I can tell you this from experience, where you have this whole row of bars and restaurants along the side of it, where you have on a typical game day afterwards, or and this particularly after Ravens games, I'll throw that in as well, you get some scenes out there that if the media wanted to, they could pump them up to look as, as you know, like, oh, what's going on? As they have been doing with Baltimore over the last few days. I'm like fights, broken windows, uh, smashed cars, all the rest of it. But it's not discussed and not talked about because it's just seen as like basically 
white people blowing off steam, basically, <laughs> is what it's seen as. And, and you know, the part that's definitely not being talked about from Saturday, which needs to be talked about, is the, and it's starting to come out now, but is the degree to which people marched on Camden Yards. Obviously, people are very upset about Freddie Gray. People are, you know, they're, they're chanting, they wanna be taken seriously. And you have just reams of drunk people coming out of the bars, laughing at people, mocking people. I mean, you, I mean, it doesn't take, you know, a scientist to see that these two elements together are not going to work well. And that's exactly what happened. And so there's today, people might have heard uh, the Baltimore Orioles are playing in front of an empty stadium. They decide to lock everybody out. Fans, workers, everything in front of an empty stadium. And there's been a lot of questions about that. You know, it's, they, they say they're doing it for public safety. They're really doing it just to keep the major league schedule going because that thing is orchestrated with a lot of money on the line. They have to make sure all the slots fall where they do. But I gotta say there's something like extremely eerily appropriate about the fact that they're playing in front of an empty stadium, uh, basically in front of a ghost town. And it's appropriate for a couple of reasons. Uh, first of all, it's appropriate because the practice of playing a professional game for money, that's on TV, in front of an empty stadium, the only place that ever, that's never happened in the United States before. The only place that that's ever, that, that happens on a regular basis is in Europe in soccer and what they do is if say you you have a team and the fans of that team do things that are viewed to be um extremely bigoted um racist homophobic chants like if it's really really egregious and scandalous like a group of fans organizing themselves like for example to do nazi salutes or throw bananas at african players one of the things that the sports leagues do as a punishment to the team is they make them play the next game in front of empty stadiums. And so there's something to me oddly appropriate about given everything that Camden Yards has represented and done about playing in front of an empty stadium. There's something also appropriate about it because the whole economic underpinnings of sports as urban policy is this idea that the neighborhood around the stadium will be built up and thriving and people, you know, like, like restaurants and, and, and everybody gets work as waiters, waitresses. And yeah, the, the restaurants have certainly opened around stadiums, but have you ever been down to that area when there's not a game going on? That's a ghost town too. So this idea of like, we're bringing the ghost town inside and then, of course, the idea of not having anybody in the stands is um, just appropriate because uh, Freddie Gray has been silenced, you know, as, as have approximately two dozen people um, in Baltimore City at the hands of Baltimore City Police. So wouldn't it also be appropriate to have the team play in conditions of silence? I'm not saying the team is making a political statement by doing this. They're not. But sometimes poetry imposes itself on situations when otherwise it would not exist. Um, so I do want to hear from you guys. I don't want to go on too long, but I also do want to say this. Like, people have to realize that like, what folks are doing um, in terms of fighting for justice for Freddie Gray and in terms of marching on the neighborhood of Camden Yards, um, it is part of a proud and longstanding and history-making tradition that says sports is not just sports. Um, it's part of our lives, it's part of our culture, it's part of our community. And if there is injustice in one part of our community, then the whole community needs to know about it. And so that's something I think people should be not only unashamed about, but that people should be proud to say that sometimes there are things more important than just games. So thank you very much, I appreciate your time. Um, I, Happy to take any questions that people have or observations or disagreements. And it could really be about anything. Um, how far the wizards are gonna go, anything. Um, was, which I feel very good about actually, but yeah. I don't really have a question, oh, sure. but I'd like to hear your viewpoint on um, college athletes getting paid. Yeah, absolutely. Oh my God. Um, it's re that's really interesting. It's a really interesting question. The idea of college athletes being paid because there, let's start with this. There was a guy named Walter Byers. Uh, he start, started the NCAA as we know it. And he started it in the mid 50s. 
and he left in 1989. So you're talking about somebody who basically built the modern NCAA and ran it for 35 years. Uh, he wrote a book after he left the NCAA where he basically said, you know what? This entire operation is just completely, completely full of crap. And he called, it, he called the entire operation of the NCAA a, 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 a neo-plantation where everybody has a plantation mentality. And this is the guy who started it, basically blowing the whistle on his life. And by any sane measure, this very book would have caused massive reform in the NCAA. But even by the late 1980s, you saw the problem, which is too much money and too many interests, having too much of an interest in keeping business as usual in the NCAA. And make no mistake about it, business of usual, as usual is about um, getting people to work without compensation. I mean, it's getting people to actually, uh, in the revenue producing sports particularly, uh, to, to you know, wear corporate logos, wear Nike logos, run up and down the court, get huge ratings for TV stations, and have um, coaches, assistant coaches, administrators, colleges make literally billions of dollars out of this, and yet they don't see anything for it. And it's always been bad. And one of the things that Walter Byers talks about is this term student athlete that we use all the time was something that the NCAA came up with um, in the late 1950s when a football player actually died on the field and his, he was married and his wife sued the NCAA for workers' compensation. And they came up with the phrase student athlete as a legal term to say to the judge, no, that's not a worker, that's a student athlete and therefore not entitled to any compensation even though he died on the field. So this thing they talk about, student athlete, it's this beautiful thing. Like, you know, it started as a, as a legal operation to keep players from getting any kind of compensation. It's kind of ugly. Um, but the, uh, the, the thing about it that I think is interesting about this moment, and I mean, I think it's connected to why, you know, you would ask that question, is that it's gotten a lot of publicity in recent years. And I think we've reached a tipping point. And one of the reasons why is about the money. I was on a sports radio show and we were talking about this very issue and the host was just a very mainstream sports radio Yahoo and, and he said to me like, in 2005 I would have like laughed at you for saying that college athletes should be paid but I can't laugh at you anymore because of just the incredible amounts of money that some of these coaches are making. And that for a lot of people has been the tipping point. Like when you have, like Mike Krzyzewski made $10 million last year coaching Duke. Um, the, uh, Dean Smith, who coached North Carolina um, 30 years ago, his salary was $35,000. So you think about that, the difference between making 35 grand a year to 10 million a year. Or you think about um, the coach at Ohio State right now is uh, Urban Meyer, a football coach. Um, a base salary of about $5 million and then all kinds of incentives on top of it. Woody Hayes coached Ohio State, he's a famous coach, late 70s, he made 42 grand a year. So, I mean, that's the thing that's making people be like, whoa, something's very broken if so much money is in the system, yet it's actually plowing itself into the hands of very few people, administrators. And what's so scary about it um, is that you're, I'm starting to see like a lot of colleges and a lot of college presidents become so dependent on revenue from football and basketball that all other concerns go out the window whether it's uh, North Carolina uh, completely uh, destroying basically the reputation of their own hard fought for African American studies department so they could use it as kind of a way station to give athletes easy grades so they would keep playing basketball. And this was a, this was a department by the way that people organized, fought, got arrested for on this campus. That then like the schools just said, hey, let's use it as a way station to keep uh, basketball players on the field. Like everything from, from things like that to covering up instances of sexual assault as a way to keep athletes on the field. And it's because everybody is so complicit in the operation running as it should because they're so dependent on the revenue that comes with it. And it, it's, it's, like it's created, I think, like this very like evil kind of Frankenstein's monster where you have a majority of college presidents say that they wish they could spend less money on college athletics while still spending more. Like I wrote that they remind me of people like at an AA meeting where there's an open bar because all they complain about is how much sports costs while they're just, you know, drinking, drinking it up. So 
that's my opinion. I think athletes should organize themselves in unions like they tried to do at Northwestern. I think they should fight for their fair share of what's happening. I think they should be treated like campus employees. That does not preclude them from going to class, to be clear. And that's one of the things that they lie about. It's like there are campus employees who go to class here at Harvard, Princeton, UCLA, Duke, everywhere. I mean, there are people who are employees of the school who go to class. You can go to class, but you should be paid what, um, what you're producing. Because last I heard, nobody ever bought Nikes because they thought Mike Krzyzewski looked good in them. So, yes, ma'am, and then you, sir. Did you have your hand up in the back? I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Not trying to put you on the spot. Then you, right there. Yeah. That's you. That's you. I just kind of wanted to, um, to peel out, to throw some feelers out, because this is what I guess has been bothering me the most, is that um, the Ravens' response to the riots. Oh, yeah. I think only one former Raven has even made a response, and nobody's taken it. Like, in the midst of it all, it, it, our Baltimore's, first of all, the Ravens started off as, I mean, like, Baltimore was paying for the Ravens to come in. So we bring you guys in and make you wealthy. Then you stand back, watch your city get destroyed. The city that pays you, I mean, bottom, the NFL pays them, but you know what I mean? And not one of them stood on the street that I saw. I, you know, I don't know what the media portrays. We all know that that can be false. But, and I'm being kind of checked by people, well, it's about the money. Um, athletes can't get involved in politics. It's going to hurt their checks. Yet this city is who you play for. Mm -hmm. And I've yet to see an athlete, mm -hmm. except for Ray Lewis, even speak out. In my opinion, you got enough money, Ray Lewis, to fly mm -hmm. up and put yourself on the street. I'm just saying because that's how you got your money. Mm -hmm. But like, where are these guys and why are they not, why are they not, st I, mean, I don't know. Because to me, as a huge sports fan, I got, first I looked to Christ, I'll start with that. Mm -hmm. Then, sadly, God family football, that's my, my family's motto. Mm -hmm. And it is, and I'm sorry if that offends anybody, but. And some days football's a little ahead of family? No, I'm just kidding, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> no, I've been there, yeah. <laughs> Um, but I, with that, I don't know, I just kind of feel like where is, but the, the, riot, the, the youth that were on the street were wearing the, the, the hats, they wear the jerseys, they make you your money, you can have a powerful influence on them to just be present in the street. Guys, knock it off. Mm -hmm. Where were they? Interesting. You, see, you know, in, um, in 1968, uh, after Dr. King was assassinated, one of the places that people were um, terrified, the city that people were terrified would literally go up entirely in smoke was Detroit. Because in 1967, there was basically an urban insurrection in Detroit. People organized themselves as, um, you know, like, like actual gun battles with the police, like the kind of stuff that makes what's, I mean, that's why knowing history is so important because you see all the news hysteria about what's happening in Baltimore. Look at any city in this country in the late 60s and it makes what happened in Baltimore. I'm not trying in any way trying to make it seem like it wasn't incredibly significant, but you're talking like in Detroit, you had tr people who came back from Vietnam, trained snipers line up against the police like going gun versus gun against the police in Detroit in 1967. You had coordinated strikes going on at the auto plants with the snipers to take on. I mean, think about that for a second. It's just like, we, we've been here before. And the real, I think, tragedy is that there's been such an unwillingness for a host of reasons that we can discuss to actually confront why we're going to be here again 10 years, 20 years down the line, because we're not confronting the root causes of this, which are poverty and racism, and there's a refusal to confront that. Um, but but the, to, the reason why I mentioned Detroit in the first place is that 67 was so intense, people thought 68 after King died, Detroit would just be, um, would, would absolutely like implode. And uh, the, the star player for Detroit at that time was African-American player whose name um, was Willie Horton. Um, somewhat unfortunately, Willie Horton, if you know your, your history, that's happen, name happened to be named Willie Horton. And Willie Horton, this just speaks to your point, he went out into the streets in his uniform to try to help folks calm them down, direct anger, not try to get people to stop, not trying to tell people not to be angry, but trying to at least show some leadership and say, how can we do this in a way that gets us the results that we want? And there's something very powerful. Like he went out in his uniform because he understood that people would listen to him more wearing that. Um, to me, 
the, no, the sheer number of athletes who, who went public after first Mike Brown and then Tamir Rice and then Eric Garner were killed in the fall. I mean, if you look at it, some were NFL players, most were NBA players, none to my count, and I track this stuff, were Major League Baseball players. And so that was one of the, th and we could talk about reasons for why that is too, but, but that was one of the things that as soon as stuff popped in Baltimore, it's like, okay, Baltimore doesn't have an NBA team where I know players are talking about this all the time in the locker room. The Ravens are scattered right now. Very few players live in the community where they play. And the Orioles, it's like, who's gonna speak out? So that's part of why I've been focusing on the Orioles, because it's like, you're right here. You're at the heart of this. Even the owner, the COO of the Orioles, uh, John Angelos, made this, who I, I criticized in my remarks, but he made this amazing statement, which people should look up, about how like, he's not concerned about broken windows or anything like that. He's concerned about the fact that not only was Freddie Gray killed, but we have 30 years of jobs being shipped out of this city in poverty, and that's the root of problem. I mean, this is what, what the owner of the Orioles was saying. And part of me was saying, well, your dad should have paid a living wage to the workers at the stadium. But, <laughs> but, it's, but it's still, it's like, it, it's, it's a wonder to me that you haven't had more Orioles step out because I think one of the things, the thing about athletes, oh, you're gonna um, jeopardize your money if you say anything. I think something that this social media age has shown is that actually you're not jeopardizing. You're standing, you're actually emboldening yourself. You, you, you are highlighting yourself. You're showing that you're an individual. You're showing that you give a damn. Um, the Jordan era of, you know, Republicans buy sneakers too and we play one game at a time, good Lord willing, play one game at a time and you don't say anything about anything, that's now considered very passe among athletes. You know, the new thing is you go on social media and you say what you think. And you saw, I thought it was amazing that the NFL, for goodness sakes, which is sometimes called the No Fun League, uh, where they have suspended players for wearing the wrong shoelaces, they did not find players for wearing the names of people who were killed by police on their uniforms. Because even the NFL understood that that would be a public relations disaster to do that. And so I don't get the logic of why an athlete wouldn't speak out, in ba a Baltimore athlete, if, you take it, if they felt in their heart like they wanted to. Well, that gets to another question. Maybe, they didn't, maybe none of them want to which is, I think, the thing that none of us really want to think because no one wants to think that the people that we cheer for may not care about us. And what is wrong with that biggest picture, that big picture? Yeah. You wouldn't be without the people in Baltimore, but you don't care about them. How is that? that and it's, kind of, it's kind of heartbreaking. And there's something heartbreaking about it because, you know, as much as we root for the name in front of the uniform, we also always, always root for the name on the back of the uniform, too. I mean, Yes, sir. I'm sorry. With the, uh, you know, <clears throat> unless you're well versed about Baltimore and the history and you study on your own, you know, so I think the incident here is Freddie Gray was killed and then there was peaceful protesters and then people exploited the situation to what it is now. So with the situation that happens now as um, the African American community and the, the Caucasian cops and and the oppression and the poverty that occurred with Freddie Gray, and, and there's numerous other incidents, but this one just happened to be a very big one. What do you think now that it, it's kind of what they wanted in all the wrong ways? I mean, this particular case has Obama, it's all over every news channel. It was the most trending thing for like the last two days on the whole internet, Facebook, yeah. everything. Um, so, so with that being said, I feel as though like that the things that happened, like there was a kid who stole a UPS truck, they burned CBS, they, they did a variety of things. So now that police oppression and poverty have reached public eye, all they see are people breaking windows and people stealing trucks. So, and, and a variety of other things, and also Stephen Robbins. Uh, with, with all this that's happened, how do you think that what's going on now is going to leave Baltimore's memory or the action from the public light being viewed as, you know, just the remembrance. Like, I know the Baltimore, the Baltimore Fire, I know the development of the, of the sports teams that's happening here, but now with this, everybody knows Baltimore, it's on everyone's tongue. So what do people see and how is that going to leave us moving forward? Well, 
Before, before I answer that question, at first I just want to say hi. A friend of mine just came in. His name's uh, the Angela Davis shirt. His name's Gary Nelson. Gary's a Baltimore firefighter who was out there oh, yeah. putting out fires the last couple of days. So he and um, and it's great to see you, Gary. Thanks I'm for coming. I'll be out of here in a couple of minutes. I gotta. Like, uh, no, I know. I know. But this, it's, it's, you but came in just I, at the right I, question. You know if you have to drive 20 miles to be with this guy for five minutes, sure. <laughs> thank you. you okay. And read everything he's written. Yes. Thank you, Gary. <laughs> You're embarrassing me, man. But, but let me just to what you said. I mean, for, you know, the most famous quote people have probably seen it. Dr. King. He said, you know, riots are the language of the unheard, and the 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 thing and the unseen as well. And the thing about what you say, like, like you can't, I mean, people like breaking windows, taking a UPS truck. I mean, all of this is a cry for despair. The craziest thing I heard is someone said, why would they burn down a CVS? That's the only place in that neighborhood we can get food. Instead of taking a step back and saying, why is a CVS the only place in the neighborhood where you can get food? And so it's the, the idea of people you know, of, of the kind of anger that it takes to, as the high school students did and some college students as well, to organize themselves um, and to actually confront the police. I mean, I think one of the things that we got to realize is that that's not happening out of nowhere. And I mean, the, the violence from the police in Baltimore has been going, and the, and the individual stories that I know have come out and people are talking about in the sun are so intense about what's ha what has been done to people that the idea of people responding is, is something that's to me as natural as breathing. And, and the, the equivalent of that is to not breathe. And I think it, it, was, it was going to explode and it did explode and it, it has people talking about Baltimore. And that last part is so important because what you said, which I think I really wanna pick up on, is you said, what is people's image of Baltimore going to be and are going forward and to me, it's like, if nothing else, the image of Baltimore is going to be Baltimore as a whole. That there is this place called West Baltimore. That there is this reality of whole places in Baltimore that nobody talks about, that people pretend doesn't exist, where people exist in a state of invisibility to the rest of the country. And so that to me is, I think, a prerequisite to progress. That people see that Baltimore is not the Inner Harbor. Baltimore is not Camden Yards. Baltimore is not Ray Lewis. Baltimore is this entire city of people who are living, breathing, dying, working every day, who found themselves in a situation where just enough was enough, and they had to do something. And like I said, that is an absolute prerequisite to social change. And thank you, Gary. I appreciate you. Um, he's <laughs> Thanks, Gary. Thank you. Thanks, Gary. Man, you're embarrassing me, Gary. I'll see you tomorrow, Gary. He's an amazing human being, Gary is though. I mean, he, he, he's a rescue diver too. Uh, so, I mean, seriously, like he's, he, he, he's the shit. He's like the guy who goes in when fire is everywhere and carries out kids and stuff. Like that's what he does. And, and it, I mean, yeah, so, so that, that's, I don't know if, if, if you want to say something too. Yeah, folks who, yeah, please. Oh, sure. Yeah, I mean, th this part, I mean, th this part is, is, I think, really important, too. I think people are focused. I think it totally needs to be reframed, honestly, because the whole, the terms of the debate have been, why didn't Stephanie Rawlings Blake call in the National Guard sooner, has been the terms of the debate, when to me, the terms of the debate have been like, why have these, it's more, like, why have these problems been ignored for so long? Um, a lot of people have gone back and looked at Mayor Rawlings Blake's uh, last State of the City address, where there was a lot of trumpeting about how complaints against the police had gone down and how police brutality, like this very rosy picture of what things were like, which obviously there's a massive disconnect between what she was saying and what the reality has been in the city. And I think that to me is what the focus should be. The other focus I think is like, I don't know, um, you got, I, I don't know if you both were at the, you were at the demonstration, I know, but one of the things that what we're talking about, like this is at the feet of the mayor and the chief of police, one of the things that was very odd to me was the way in which they made like this armed encampment around the police station. As if like this is, I mean, they, they blocked off whole streets 
to the police station and I was, I was asking um, a friend of mine, I was like, what happens if like, you just need to go to the police station because like your kid is missing or something. Like, how do you get there? Like they have taken what is in theory and keep in mind in theory in huge highlighter in quotes, but in theory it's supposed to be a place that's meant for you know, a public service where it's like you go in if you have a problem, et cetera, et cetera. And they've armed it off with, with like huge block radius around. And then the other thing about it was um, like, you know, we'd march and it was like, it was eerie, like how little police presence there was until you got to the part of the city that they valued. And that message that gets sent that some things are valued and some, and some people aren't is why one person yelled, um, like they only care about the Orioles. Like that was a big yell that came out when people crossed the divide. And it's, I mean, there's some, so that's why I, I, I can't say this enough, that it is a prerequisite to having a real discussion about Baltimore that people notice the whole of Baltimore. And if that took fighting police, if that took broken windows to make that noticing that Baltimore a reality, then we have to realize that, that to wish that didn't happen is sort of like wishing that the sun won't rise tomorrow in the east and set in the west. I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a reality of people's lives and how much pressure they felt under and how that pressure eventually exploded. And, and, and one thing's for certain, it's like, the, it's like that was organized. I mean, young people organized themselves for the purposes of having their voices heard. And the response of the city was to shut down the institutions that young people go to. And so you think about that for a second. You know, the, the response of the city was to put out all of this word that three different gangs had colluded to come up with a hit list of police. We know that now to be a total lie, but we know that also scared the holy crap out of people at the same time. So yes, about, about the mayor, it's like that's what I'm more looking towards is like, what's that about? You know, it's like, what, why aren't you putting out statements um, about what the plan is going to be going forward to address. And, and frankly, where's the plan to have some arrests in the death of Freddie Gray? Because, I mean, and, you know, and I feel like we've become almost um, so calloused to this. You know what I'm saying? Like, so used to the fact that, like, instead of us being like, wait a minute, he, he was arrested April 12th? And, you know, I mean, we're headed up on three weeks. And it's like, imagine if a loved one of yours was killed in any context. And, and everybody knew who did it, but it was three weeks before an arrest. I mean, with people knowing who did it. I mean, it's, it's, that's the sort of thing that I think is driving these points. Because if there had been arrests already, you would not have seen what had happened. It's as simple as that. So if you're not heard, you try to be heard. Yes? Actually, oh, I'm sorry, I couldn't even see. Can I just ask you, sir, I'm sorry, could, can you name some of the athletes who were there? Um, Keon Carpenter. Okay. Um, I can't even remember. No, no, that, that's my job. I should know this. Some people from the Detroit Lions. It was a lot okay. of people. Because Cloverdale used to they're from Baltimore. And if you know, it's like the basketball mecca around here. Yeah. yeah. And on Monday night, when the streets were being blocked off, it was my friends. Coaches, wrestling coaches, basketball coaches that shut down complete blocks. One person. Because they knew most of those kids. That's See, that's what I'm saying. Athletes, they, like, they coaches do. have this. Yeah. And but NFL you, players, NBA players, even minor leagues, they have this power yeah. over our youth. It's amazing. So, sir, what's your name, if I could ask you? I'm Kevin Lamb. Well, one, Kevin's making a really good point that, that I think really does have to be part of this discussion, which um, is that there really, there was a time when athletes lived in the communities where they played. And that became their adopted home. And Ray Lewis is an anomaly. His brother went to high school here, so he's invested in Mount yeah. Joe. You know, they're, they're invested in the community. These other guys come here for five years.
Not even. I mean, typical NFL career is three and a half years. But you could, I'm talking yeah. about like Oklahoma where I went to college and where something happened, you know? Like, it's just, it, it's not feasible. It doesn't oh, make sense rattle. for me to do that. Oh. But where I was born and raised, that's where all my boys, that's why they were down there in the trenches. And I, wish I, I just feel like them. there's an ethical responsibility. If you're playing for, for a team in Baltimore, you should. I kind of agree with you, but it's, it's not reality. We've, we've, we have time for one more question. I just want to, I was right. Two more? Oh, you, okay, we have time for two more questions. Go ahead. No, no, please. No, go ahead. Okay, go ahead. Um, well, I just had a question about something a little bit different. Um, so, when everything happened with Ray Rice and um, his wife, Sasha Beyonce at the time, um, there was a lot of think pieces out that were like, you can't be a social activist and be a fan of the NFL. Mm. And I kind of wonder like, how you feel about that, especially being so invested in both of those things. Um, how you feel the NFL handled the situation? Well, oh, and the NFL handled it horribly because Roger Goodell is a cover-up artist, I mean, of the first order. Um, but I'll speak very quickly so we can get both questions in, but I wrote a lot about it at the time. And I mean, I mean the NFL as an institution is, is like, it's just a thoroughly corrupt institution at the corporate level. I mean, but when we're talking about the game is still the game. And I think that's, um, as much as they use sports to exploit communities, as much as sports can be used as a way to create this sort of false idea of what kids, particularly young boys, particularly young uh, African-American boys, like should be the ideal of what they are when they grow up. As t In other words, as toxic as sports can be, um, I'm a big believer that sports is like fire and you could use fire to cook a meal or burn down your house. And so what I always talk to people, it's like, yeah, I, I, every time someone says like the problems of sports are X, Y, and Z, NFL does this, this, I say yes, so let's fight to reclaim it, not reject it. Because I mean, too many people have fought too hard for too long to have sports be this space where we can have real discussions about, I mean, think about just the discussion we're having about Ray Lewis. I mean, that's not really a discussion about Ray Lewis. It's a discussion about community, about responsibility, about the idea of putting your hand out, about role models. I mean, and that, that's what sports allows for. It allows for kind of like this ideological Trojan horse where we can talk about bigger issues through a common vocabulary that a lot of us share. Like, I'm sure folks in this here, a lot of folks here would have no idea about the situation that I grew up in and I would have zero idea about the situation you grew up in, but we could have a shared discussion about sports that then allows for this connective tissue to happen, which is I think something really special that, I, that I'm not ready to give up by any stretch, as, as angry as I am about so much that's involved with sports. So I'm just saying like, let's not check our brains at the door when we, when we enjoy the games is what I'm saying. Yes, ma'am. Um, are you familiar with like the terms outside the man frame, like with the way they use what's called like putting out stories? Yeah. Like outside frame is when you look at like individual circumstances, like how they target the protesters and the leaders, but they didn't target the fact that you got impoverished areas and mm -hmm. the fact that it's a lot of gentrification going on in the city mm -hmm. and homes are getting knocked down. Mm -hmm. How do you feel as though that puts Mm -hmm. Far more like, like he kind of said, moving forward, like in a bad light, like, because they're only looking at what we're doing. They're not looking at what's causing us to do it. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's the major problem. Mm -hmm. this, this is why people were so upset. Because mm -hmm. it was like, oh, okay, so you can come here and you can talk about us burning down the CBS mm -hmm. or running into a package, please. But you don't talk about how you're like moving homeless and campus from the mm -hmm. harbor and leaving a whole bunch of people like. And the, and the other thing, you're right, no, no, gentrification or, which, which a friend of mine always, I, I like the term gentrification because it's a common term and people immediately know what you, what you mean, but my, I have a friend on Facebook and she's a terrific uh, professor of African American descent and she always says like, say gentrification, always make sure to say, no, ethnic cleansing, not gentrification, ethnic cleansing. You know, like let's be clear about what it is, ethnic cleansing. I think the term gentrification is, is also very useful, like I said, because it's a common vocabulary. We all know what we're talking about with it. And the ways in which sports has been used and the stadium construction has been used as kind of like, a, like a, almost like a strategic hamlet of gentrification. So it's like where the stadium goes, that's where the, that's where the homes are gonna be knocked down. That's where the displacement's gonna take place and the uses of sports in that regard. But you, I gotta say that you, you are so absolutely right. I got home from the demonstrations um, on Saturday pretty late and I got home like in, so incredibly impressed with 
the incredible levels of organization, the people I'd met who'd been doing this work painstakingly forever who were at that march, the young people who organized themselves. I was at the march and there was a woman there named uh, Michaela Gilliam Price. Um, I don't know if people know that name or not, but she, she's just a student organ. She works for the group, the, the uh, Baltimore Block is the name of the group that she, she works with. Kelly Gilliam Price, she's, um, I think she's like 18, 19 years old. In 1998, I was, I live in DC. In 1998, I was in Baltimore almost every day because the state of Maryland was trying to execute a man at the death row, which is located in right in the middle of Baltimore City. That's where the death row is. And the man they were executing was a guy named Tyrone Gilliam Price. Tyrone, Tyrone, no, he changed his name. I'm sorry, let me do it right. Tyrone X Gilliam. And Tyrone X Gilliam's niece was this cute little four-year-old girl who would be in her father's arms when we would do these marches. And that's Michaela Gilliam Price, who's leading the student protest now. And that, so it's like that level of just generational organizing and also that level of knowing like, wow, we fought for her uncle in 1998 and we lost, but we didn't like lose everything because it affected a new generation of people who are gonna fight this fight, like that kind of thing it is, is, was so apparent to me Saturday. So the point is I got home Saturday and I was like so impressed by it. And I was like, yeah, I saw some of the confrontations and whatnot, but that to me was like, seriously, like 1% like, like of my day's experience, of my eight, nine hour experience was that. And to see that dominate the news cycle was like, my jaw was on the ground. Like, and I shouldn't be that way. I mean, I should be cynical. I've been doing this long enough, but I was so stunned by the gap between what I saw and what was being reported that, um, that it doesn't surprise me that that then causes the frustration to build on itself. And just to give this other idea is like today I had a choice of doing two things, which was come here to talk to y'all, which I'm glad I did. And the other choice was to go on MSNBC and talk about the Camden Yards issue, which I was immediate, uh, originally psyched to do because it was like, you know, a chance to go on TV and talk about gentrification and all these issues. I was like, I was ready to do it. And they said, great, we're gonna send a car for you to take you to Baltimore to do it. We're doing it live from Baltimore and we've set up a stage right in front of the burned out CVS. And I was like, oh, hell no. I'm going to Baltimore Community College Essex, I'm gonna speak, here. you know, it's just like, it became this thing where, I mean, I wasn't gonna ditch the day. I'm not saying that, but I was saying like, like I, was, I, was, I was at first trying to figure out like, how can I finagle it? So I speak here, go there and do all that. But then when they told me they were setting up a set in front of it, I mean, that's exactly what you're talking about because then they're gonna define Baltimore by this image of a burned CVS. Instead of, I mean, if they really, really, really wanted to be honest, they could show whole neighborhoods of Baltimore that did not get touched by anything that's happened over the last week that needs cleanup, that needs investment, that needs all the things. It's almost like they're shocked to discover this. And that to me speaks to the invisibility that's imposed on the poor, that's imposed on people of color, and that's imposed on people who don't have the megaphone to speak out and be heard. So I did not know that term that you said because that was your first question. Did I know that term? But I feel like I've lived it over the last week. Right. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't know it, but I know it. <laughs> but thank you all very much. This has been my privilege. I appreciate it. And